Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to coming to speak. It's always a pleasure to come up uh, to Edinburgh. I always feel slightly guilty coming up and talking about uh, the development of anatomy in London, given the importance of Edinburgh as a centre for the teaching of anatomy. And to make it worse, although I'm talking about uh, some Scots in my talk this afternoon, they're Glaswegians. So if I'm not tarred and feathered and run out of town, I hope you will enjoy the, uh, um, what I have to say. So to begin, I'm going to take you back to the second half of the 18th century to Surgeons Hall in London. On the 4th of October 1759, John Tate, the Master of Anatomy of the Company of Surgeons, commenced a series of three public lectures over the body of the murderer, Richard Lamb. He was under no illusions as to the nature of his audience. He spoke thus. Curiosity, more than improvement, has, I am persuaded, drawn the greater part of this audience together, and so such as come from mere curiosity will reap little benefit from the view of the dissected subject, yet that their time here may not wholly be thrown away, I would wish them to consider the crime which has occasioned their presence. Let the anatomical table in the surgeon's theatre be a preacher to this audience." Now, Tate's appraisal of his audience was an honest one, signally absent from the crowds who attended the dissections of murderers at the Surgeon's Company, conducted under the terms of the Murder Act of 1752, were young surgeons or physicians wishing to learn anatomy. While Tate's lectures and those of his fellow masters of anatomy at Surgeon's Hall were conducted in public, a, a relic of what the historian Andrew Cunningham has termed the sacred ritual of public anatomy, which developed in Renaissance Italy, by the 1760s in London, anatomy teaching had developed a very different character. Evidence of this different character comes from the diary of the Pennsylvanian student William Shippen, who spent the winter of 1759-1760 as a medical student in London. While Tate lectured, Shippen was busy in the anatomy school in Covent Garden, run by the brothers William and John Hunter. And on the 5th of October, his diary recorded that while Tate was lecturing, he rose at seven in the morning and, apart from breaks for breakfast and dinner, spent his entire day in the dissecting room. The following day, while Tate still lectured at Surgeon's Hall, Shippen stuck to his routine. Saturday, October the 6th, rose at 7, spent the day in the dissecting room till 5, Dr Hunter's lecture till 7.30, bed at 10.30, talking anatomy with Mr Hunter from supper. So Shippen's experiences can be considered typical. In his studies, he was following an injunction set out by William Hunter in his lectures. William Hunter told his students, I think it my duty to entreat you to dissect as much as you can. He went on, there is here an opportunity of learning anatomy to the best advantage by attending the dissecting room. One winter's attendance there will certainly make a diligent student a good anatomist. And it was this close association with dissection in the dissecting room rather than in the lecture theatre, in the formal theatre at least of Surgeon's Hall, that anatomy was taught in London. And it was this close attention to dissection that marked out the distinct advantage that London had over Edinburgh and the other European centres for medical education in the 18th century. That William Hunter and his, uh, his contemporaries were able to promote the practice of dissection to this extent was in part a consequence of the dissolution of the Barber Surgeons Company in London in 1745. Here we have an eyewitness view of the barbers and the surgeons separating. And having separated and, new, and a new company of surgeons been formed, the restrictions on surgeons teaching anatomy by dissection in their own premises for their own personal profit were relaxed. And between 1745 and the end of the century, there were some 60 or so individuals in London who gave courses in anatomy, surgery, midwifery, all of which involved, to greater or lesser degree, the practice of dissection. 
Now, of this merry band of dissectors, the brothers William and John Hunter are today perhaps the best known, partly because both bequeathed museum collections to public institutions, John Hunter's collection to what was then the Company of Surgeons, now the Royal College of Surgeons, where I work, William Hunter's collections, of course, to the University of Glasgow. And the two institutions have done much to foster the posthumous reputation of these two men. And in doing so, I think, have perhaps given them greater prominence amongst their contemporaries than perhaps they had at the time. Not to downplay their achievements, but there were many more anatomy teachers of whom virtually all record has been lost. In perpetuating their reputations, they have done much, particularly the Royal College of Surgeons with John Hunter in fostering the idea of John Hunter in particular as a heroic figure, a founder of scientific surgery, the man who made surgeons gentlemen through his assiduous attention to the practice of dissection and to the practice of experimental natural philosophy. And the historian Stephen Jacchino has written a lot about the way in which this reputation was constructed in the, in the 19th century as an active process by the college. And the Royal College of Surgeons still actively promotes Hunter as a founding figure today. We have Hunterian orations and lectures, the Hunterian Museum. He's still a very important figure. But what I'm trying to do with my research, what I'm trying to do this afternoon, is to give you an idea of how they were perceived by their contemporaries and the way in which heroic character might have been visible or absent during their lifetimes. And while dissection was widely practiced before the hunters, William Harvey, for example, stands out, but many more practicing dissection before the mid part of the 18th century, I think there is something very important about this 50-year period in which dissection moved from being something, something conducted as an occasional process through experimental natural philosophy in the case of Harvey or through the practice of private post-mortems on individual patients to being something which every young medical practitioner was expected to do as part of their training. And so there's a very important shift in the nature of dissection and in the way it's perceived, which takes place in this 50-year period and which is particularly concentrated in London. Now, this practice of dissection was not unproblematic, not least because both John and William Hunter and their contemporaries were forced to rely on a rather problematic supply of bodies. They weren't entitled to the bodies of criminals executed at the gallows at Tyburn. Under the Murder Act, murderers in London had their bodies delivered to the company of surgeons, not to the private teachers. So the private teachers made other arrangements, most notably with the grave robbers, the resurrectionists, the body snatchers, who would supply the cadavers for their courses. So that was one area that made their work rather difficult. And, of course, there was the perception of dissection as well. And William Hogarth's famous plate, The Fourth Stage of Cruelty, The Reward of Cruelty, in which Tom Nero is seen being dissected at a composite scene, a composite of the old physician's and barber surgeon's hall, reflected this perception of dissection as a cruel and barbaric act. And Hogarth's plate, which circulated very widely throughout the second half of the 18th century, was often used, and is still used by historians, as a reference point to the perception of dissection. One contemporary 18th century commentator reflected on the reward of cruelty thus, saying it revealed the unfeeling heart of a dissector, which is found to grow so callous by his practice as to lose entirely his natural sensibility. So dissection was perceived as a debasing experience, something to be feared by the subject, but something which would also compromise the moral character of the dissector. And to give you an idea of how even the merest glimpse of dissection might colour people's perceptions, this painting by Hogarth is rather revealing. Um, Sigismunda mourning over the heart of her lover Giscardo, painted by Hogarth in 1759, a catastrophic foray by Hogarth into history painting. The reason was the heart, painted by Hogarth from a specimen lent to him by the surgeon Caesar Hawkins. 
described by one art critic as a piece of bloody pluck gathered from the butcher's yard, which debased the entire scene. The idea that anatomical accuracy might enhance the picture was clearly not something which this critic appreciated. So even the merest exposure to the decepted body in the 18th century could be seen as somehow tainting. And this contemporary view entitled Doctors Dissecting by the artist John Hamilton Mortimer shows two figures identifiable as William and John Hunter. William Hunter, the wise owl with his spectacles, John Hunter, the young cock with the cockle on his head. The cockle almost certainly refers to John Hunter's experiments in tooth transplantation, where he tried to grow human teeth in the combs of cockerels. And laid out before them this poor stolen body laid out on what looks like a coffin with a spade and a smashed head, these beasts of carrion gathering around. This is not a flattering view of the dissectors at work. And embodied in it is this visceral disgust with dissection, here represented by Mortimer portraying the two hunters. So my aim today is to show how this threat to personal character associated with the practice of dissection was deflected, both managed by anatomists, by the adoption and adaptation of pre-existing notions of virtuous behaviour. So we might look, for example, at the codes of manners which existed in the 18th century. And in the early part of the 18th century, people like the Earl of Shaftesbury wrote at great length on how men should behave, and in particular, what made a man fit to govern, a man fit to hold authority within the state. And for Shaftesbury, these were qualities of refinement, a man who was able to set aside the cares of the world, and in doing so, to exercise a degree of control and judgment unsullied by worldly cares. Now, the art historian Martin Myrone has suggested that in the period after 1750, and particularly at the end of the 1750s with the Seven Years' War, this notion of those fit to govern being a refined elite came under threat in the Seven Years' War, which uh, Britain did eventually win, uh, there were some significant early reversals. And during this time, criticism that luxury had enervated the ruling elite became particularly acute. In the world of high art, the response was to develop figures of brutal masculine authority. And we can see this in Mortimer's representation of Sir Arthur Gull, the Knight of Justice, and the Iron Man, taken from Spencer's Fairy Queen. These are robust male role models, not um, debilitated by an addiction to luxury or effeminacy. And this is the reaction against the idea of refinement. The same was true of John Brown, who in his estimate of the manners and principles of the times, declared that men were sunk into effeminacy and as a result were unfit to govern. And it was the desire to reconcile these qualities of on the one hand, refined moral behaviour, with on the other hand, a certain robust judgement that occupied moral philosophers, particularly in the 1760s and 1770s. And one in particular was Adam Smith, his theory of moral sentiment published in 1759 and an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations published in 1776 attempted to outline the basis for a virtu virtuous political economy underpinned by individuals' quest for personal profit and advancement. Now, the application of Smith's moral philosophy to the practice of anatomy is interesting for several reasons. First, much of Smith's work is concerned with determining the ways in which men of commerce might play a role in civic society, the control of which had been hitherto the responsibility of these educated gentlemen. And in particular, the ability um, 
And in particular, anatomists fell into this category because, of course, the anatomists working in London in the second half of the 18th century were commercial entrepreneurs. They were teaching privately. And Smith, in his letters, singles out the hunters as examples of entrepreneurial skill, suggesting that medical education would better follow that model than confining teaching to universities. So... Smith's work, which is concerned with how men who aren't by birth gentlemen might play a role in society, seems particularly apt applied to anatomists. Secondly, Smith was working in and was influenced by a strong tradition of Christian Stoicism, or Neo-Stoicism, an important component of Scottish Enlightenment thought, particularly derived from the work of the Roman writer Marcus Aurelius from the 2nd century AD. Um, Smith noted, every man, as the Stoics used to say, is first and principally recommended to his own care, and every man is certainly, in every respect, fitter and abler to take care of himself than any other person. So in Smith's work, we see a very strong strand of Stoicism adapted to suit the times. Smith was careful not to posit the brutal figure as the proper man, He did say that masculine qualities should be tempered by sensibility and particularly sympathy with others. But he also said that this sympathy should be tempered by judgment. Man should not be a slave to his passions. And all of these aspects, the entrepreneurial self-advancement, the idea of a man whose judgment is sympathetic but tempered by reason, are elements that anatomists sought to play up in describing themselves to others. Now, as an introduction to how Stoicism might be seen in respect to anatomy, this medal commissioned from Edward Birch for William Hunter, I think is a wonderful uh, example. Um, As the historian Linda Payne has shown, contemporary conceptions of gentility and masculine virtue also provided opportunities for the representation of anatomical study in a more positive light. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, practitioners of of dissection sought to deflect criticism by depicting their own work as a form of manly endeavour against which their opponents were perceived as timorous or effeminate. The surgeon William Cowper suggested that those industrious in disparaging the attempts of others in their inquiries into humane bodies were driven by a laziness of their tempers or an unaptness to anatomical disquisition. They couldn't do anatomy because they were lazy or because they were effeminate. So anatomists were, by definition, masculine and hard-working. The artist uh, Charles Reuben Riley, a student of Mortimer, posed the same question, whether anatomical knowledge might be acquired sufficiently without dissection. And he argued that although the use of wax models and and statues provided a means for studying anatomy, without those mangled bodies which proved so disgusting to refined feelings, their superficial appeal meant that however plausible the objections to anatomy might appear, they would prove in reason's eye to be frivolous pretenses suggested by lazy students. So again, the idea that those who eschewed dissection were in some way lazy or not up to the job. So there were two concepts on offer here. First, that knowledge of anatomy could only be procured through the expenditure of considerable effort. And secondly, that this close engagement with a subject considered offensive to the physical and moral senses was an improving rather than debasing experience. And this is something which Hunter explained told his students in his lectures about being a diligent anatomist. Shippen's diaries reveal his hard work. His compatriot John Morgan's diaries reveal he was as industrious as a bee in the dissecting room while working in London. And likewise, the fellow student James Ware's diary reveals long days spent dissecting under the anatomist Joseph Else. The degree to which this work might change a man for the better is evident in the letters of Seven Eyre, a Virginian student in London whose self-confessed appetite for gambling and whoring makes the term dissolute appear thoroughly inadequate. 
Ayer's letters to his brother, written while a student in London, are preserved in the Virginia Historical Society, recorded picking up underage prostitutes, squandering the money meant for his lessons on games of chance. However, within a few months of starting in London, there's a significant change. He becomes a student attending John Hunter's lectures. And by the end of his winter studies, Ayer was able to write, this is a wonderful change from my former manner of living. In Virginia, the card table, gallantry, and a pair of good horses, and the luxuries of the table engrossed my whole attention. Behold me now. He was transformed. He went on, grant me capacity and perseverance to effect this undertaking, that on my return my much-loved friends may, with propriety, exert their interest to afford me an opportunity of rendering my country a service that I may be enabled to procure a good wife and partake of the pleasures which such a delightful country affords. So for Eyre, this was a rite of passage to go through to earn him the benefits of a position in society. And that's precisely what this medal from William Hunter's school captures. You can see the portrait of Hunter on the obverse. On the reverse is this figure of a cup, which is a cup presented to Hunter by his students in 1760 with a dissection scene. And the dissection scene links the hunters through a tradition of classical anatomy through Vesalius back to Galen. So it lends some classical history to what they're doing. But of more interest is the inscription above it. So we have Olim Meminisse Uwabit a line abbreviated from Virgil's Aeneid, for san haec olim meminisse uabit. Perhaps even one day these things will be pleasant to recall. And the line is part of Aeneas's speech to his shattered crew after their shipwreck on the shores of Carthage, rendered in John Dryden's 1697 translation as follows. With me, the rocks of Scylla you have tried, the inhuman Cyclops and his den defied. What greater ills hereafter can you bear? Resume your courage and dismiss your care. An hour will come with pleasure to relate your sorrows past as benefits of fate. Through this inscription, the medal indicates the manner in which dissection was portrayed in the context of a mid-18th century reinvention of the Stoic ideal, part of the arduous and rocky way of virtue. So this hard labour that students had to go through in the dissecting room was presented as a necessary trial, something which would fit them to go out into the world and to become great practitioners. And through that, to earn the benefits that they deserved, the pleasures of life that Seven Air was so so much looking forward to on his return to Virginia. And to be fair, the dangers attached to this hard labour were very real. In his 1795 tract on the absolute necessity of encouraging instead of preventing the study of anatomy, the man midwife and former lecturer William Rowley spelt out the nature of this difficult path as applied to anatomy. The student who had wished to discharge his duties with a conscientious rectitude must repeatedly, with his own hands, dissect dead human bodies, must breathe for many months in the unpleasant and frequently destructive air of a dissecting room. He must risk his own life to be serviceable to others. Rowley noted that some of the brightest ornaments of the profession had been lost to these necessary, though horridly disagreeable, pursuits. And he cited the examples of William Hewson and Magnus Magnus Falconer, two of the hunter's contemporaries, as examples, victims of the dissecting room. Hewson died from a cut sustained in a dissection which turned putrid, while Falkland's death was blamed on the putrid atmosphere of the dissecting room. Likewise, the death of the Oxford anatomist John Parsons in 1785 was attributed to studies which necessarily exposed him to fatigue and danger. Philip Pitt Walsh died in 1787 from a fatal dissecting room injury, and the Times noted at the time, there are five or six pupils at this time in the same alarming predicament. 
So this hard labor in the dissecting room presented a very real danger to the anatomists who pursued it. Now, recasting dissection as a form of masculine endeavor, which would earn its practitioners benefits in the long run, was one way of turning its noisome nature into a badge of distinction. It also provided a means through which the perceived threat to personal moral character could be deflected. And the model of civic humanism developed by Adam Smith, based upon rational self-interest tempered by sensibility, um, expressed through sympathy to others, was one which they sought to develop. In his theory of moral sentiments, Smith articulated a concept of humane civilization underpinned by such sensibility which he contrasted with savage societies such as that of the Spartan, whose circumstances not only habituate him to every sort of distress, but teach him to give way to none of the passions which that distress is apt to excite. Now, what Smith is articulating here is a particular notion of Stoic virtue. Stoics, of course are famous for resisting the effects of passions. For the original Stoics, the highest state is apathy, one entirely unswayed by emotion. But the point is that emotion should not be ignored, it should be overcome. So the advantage of Stoicism is it teaches a way of managing emotion rather than just doing away with them. And this is what Smith is um, arguing for, and this is what anatomists also seek to portray in their work. Thus, Smith wrote that the compassion of the spectator must arise altogether from the consideration of what he himself would feel if he was reduced to the same unhappy situation. And, what is perhaps impossible, was at the same time to regard it with his present reason and judgment. So he should feel sympathy, but apply reason at the same time. The sensible man was therefore one who could balance sympathy and reason. And anatomists were careful to spell out the way in which dissection served not to debase them, to prevent them feeling emotion, but to give them a way of managing emotion. And if one looks at the way in which surgery was performed in the 18th century, one can see how this ability to suspend sympathy might be important. I dare say that Smith was himself cognizant of this. He travelled to London in 1787 to be treated by John Hunter for his piles, so perhaps not quite an operation on this scale, but certainly an operation which in the pre-anaesthetic era would have exposed him to significant pain. So the patient had to demonstrate stoicism by resisting pain, but the surgeon also had to resist sympathy with the patient, keep a cool head, and operate effectively. Thus, said William Hunter, dissection is important because it informs the head, guides the hand, and familiarizes the heart with a kind of necessary inhumanity in the use of cutting instruments. And the advantage of this necessary inhumanity is evident in the case of John Burley, treated by John Hunter for this massive tumour, a benign salivary adenoma, as it's now described. Burley was a, a patient of John Hunter's at St. George's Hospital. He underwent an operation to remove the, the tumour, which took over 20 minutes, during which, said Hunter, the patient did not cry out once. So Burley himself demonstrated great stoicism in the face of pain, but Hunter too, in making sure that his dissection of this tumour was a careful and steady process, was not hasty, was not botched. And the picture of Burley afterwards showing a neat scar and, according to Hunter's casebooks, no evidence of a facial palsy suggests that Hunter's ability to dissect out the tumour without damaging the nerves was a tribute to his anatomical skill, but also his ability not to rush the operation. Hunter's expertise, therefore, didn't translate into recklessness. And in his lectures to students using language which, which evoked Adam Smith's, John Hunter argued that anatomical knowledge was the key not only to successful surgery, but also to its avoidance. 
operations were, he said in his lectures, a tacit acknowledgement of the insufficiency of surgery. It is like an armed savage who attempts to get that by force which a civilised man would get by stratagem. No surgeon should approach the victim of an operation without a sacred dread and reluctance. And William Hunter, too, was adamant that the effect of dissection was not to predispose the practitioner towards needless cruelty. In describing a paper on malformations of the heart, which he'd investigated through the dissection of several young infants, Hunter was careful to allay fears he'd done this out of idle curiosity. And he said that the advantage of this attention to dissection, however unpleasant it might be, was that it prevented the surgeon carrying out unnecessary treatment. In a word, he said, torturing a miserable and incurable human creature. So the study of dissection taught these surgeons a degree of dispassion, what we'd now call clinical detachment, and it also taught them how to avoid unnecessary surgery and therefore to avoid pain. So at the same time, they were still sympathetic to their patients. However, although anatomists were successful in presenting dissection as a form of masculine endeavour, in other regards, this gendering of dissection as a male pursuit could be problematic. In his unflattering portrayal of a dissection made in the late 1770s, Thomas Rowlandson added to the lumpen barbarity of the group of surgeons seen dissecting an added accusation of sexual impropriety in the form of the two students wrestling with a naked female body. Now, Rowlandson was no stranger to the use of erotic or obscene imagery for titillation rather than satire or caricature. He made a good living from producing pornographic drawings as well as his more familiar satirical works. And that this drawing was left unfinished suggests that perhaps in this case even Rowlandson felt it overstepped the mark of decency. Nevertheless, the rendering of the dissected body as female was a device very frequently employed and broadly disseminated in literary and graphic genres as a means of accentuating the moral dangers attached to dissection. So this rather more staid image of William Hunter fleeing, having been caught by the watch with the body of a young woman in his basket inevitably presents the grave rob body as that of a young woman. One attack on grave robbing published in 1754 in the form of a posthumous letter from a young female victim emphasised dissection as an act of sexual violence. In it, the young woman, writing from beyond the grave, said, Me he carried while it was yet night, tumbled into a basket to another house. I was laid once more in a cold corner, naked and unregarded. They quickly began the horrible work. The shining knife was plunged into my breast and my whole body was laid open. A similar connection between licentiousness and body snatching was made in a poem published in the Ladies' Magazine in 1749 on stealing the body of a young woman to be anatomised from St Peter's churchyard. For shame, for shame, Oxonians all, and blush to find it said, not pleased to steal the girls alive, but must ye steal them dead? Insatiate nature thus directs, nor is it strange, I own, that those who love to taste the flesh should like to pick the bone. So this gendering of the dissected body as female and the presentation of dissection as a sexual act was one of the ways in which anatomists were criticised in the popular press. Such language added to the indecency of dissection an implicit association with the solitary vice of masturbation, itself the object of renewed moral and medical disquisition in the later 18th century following the publication of Samuel Tissot's essay on onanism. And in the character of Thomas Rowlandson's persevering surgeon, we can see this conjunction between anatomy and private vice. The surgeon locked in solitary dissection highlights the way in which dissection could be seen to equate to lascivious depravity. The negative connotations attached to privacy and dissection, however, weren't purely sexual. There was a more widespread concern about solitary activity and 
this rather gentler image by Joseph Wright of Derby, a painter whose interest in the settings for different kinds of knowledge production forms a powerful theme in his work, used the device of a solitary figure engaged in anatomical study in his Philosopher by Lamplight. So here, the philosopher is presented as a slightly sinister figure being approached in his cave by these two rather cautious explorers. So there's a more general perception of dissection carried out behind closed doors as being problematic because it links into this broader concern with solitary pursuits. And thus, anatomists were careful to present their work as a social activity. And Thomas Rowlandson's depiction of the dissecting room, which I think is probably a very fair presentation of how dissection by students was actually conducted in the late 18th century, does show it as being, although rather ghastly with these dissected bodies, not nearly as susceptible to the kinds of um, uh, associations conjured up by his persevering surgeon. So the idea that dissection might be conducted as a homosocial group activity was a way of deflecting these accusations of solitary impropriety. So the presentation of dissection as a social activity was also advantageous because it presented it in a form which was more um, compatible with other kinds of knowledge production, in particular with the study of experimental natural philosophy in which the idea of assembling an audience to witness what you were doing was a way of lending legitimacy to your findings. And the idea of dissection being conducted as a group activity was one way in which it could be raised to the same kind of level as experimental natural philosophy. And many of the reports of dissections, whether observations in the dissecting room or private post-mortems make great play of who else was present when particular findings were revealed by dissection. And in doing so also made it clear that this wasn't a solitary surgeon engaged in anything improper by himself, but conducted quite often in the case of private post-mortems with the family's, patient, uh, family's, the patient's family in the same room. This was a case, for example, in the post-mortem of John Heman, a deputy of the City of London, which was carried out by the surgeon James Ware in 1789, conducted in the presence of his physician, John Coakley Letsom, as well as some friends of the family and several other respectable professional men. So assembling these audiences together was a way of making anatomy more contiguous with a broader group of social actors. And more prosaically, the pursuit of student dissection as a social activity helped def define a community of practitioners with a shared experience. So this idea of having gone through an arduous and dangerous process was one which helped bring them together as a community. And by the end of the 18th century... As anatomy, as dissection, became an accepted part of medical education, this idea of a community of practitioners with a shared experience helped provide a kind of concrete barrier defining a new professional grouping. So by that stage, it was a way of excluding those who had not been through this. Those physicians who didn't want to bother with dissection were seen as somehow lacking an essential, not only group area of knowledge, but also an essential part of experience, because they simply couldn't know what went on in the dissecting room. And so over the course of 50 years, from 1750 to the end of the 18th century, we see a transformation in the perception of dissection in which it moves from being something which is conducted in isolated cases in, with a degree of secrecy to something which is conducted with widespread knowledge in a closed environment, yes, but with a group of practitioners there in which the accusations of impropriety are deflected by the presentation of it as a necessary, a necessary process to be gone through, as something which tempers and hardens the practitioner, doesn't make him brutal or desensitised, but enables him to perform the difficult work of surgery in particular. And we can see this transition very clearly in the portraits of anatomists. 
So two portraits of William Hunter, both from the same period in the early 1760s, presenting him as a refined figure. This is the anatomist cast in the mould of Shaftesbury's man of manners, a gentleman, someone attuned to refinement and polite sensibility, someone who, in this image here, appears to be slightly averse to anatomy, turning away from the preparation in the background. In contrast, John Hunter, painted by Joshua Reynolds some 25 years later, sits at ease with his anatomical objects in the pose of a philosopher, a man of thought. He's not presented as a brutal dissector, but as somebody who is lost in reverie, inspired by his anatomical studies. And this trope is copied by Charles White, the Manchester anatomist, and the portrait of John Heaviside, another London anatomist, in his mezzotint after Johann Zoffany. And moving forward into the early 19th century, John Abernethy. Here we see a surgeon entirely comfortable in his skill as an anatomist and presenting himself in a distinctively heroic pose. This is a man who evinces no diffidence about the process he's been through. Likewise, Sir Astley Cooper, the man who was instrumental in the passage of the Anatomy Act in 1832, which enshrined surgeons' rights to bodies. This is not a man crippled by self-doubt. So in that transformation from the diffident refinement of William Hunter to the almost arrogant heroism of Astley Cooper, we see the transformation in the fortunes of anatomists over a 50-year period. And in fact, by the end of the 18th century, the idea of the heroic surgeon is one which almost becomes a joke, particularly when the surgeon uses his authority over the patient. Here we have a victim of what the doctors call the heroic treatment, a, a satire on the self-confidence of surgeons in the early 19th century when it comes to performing operations. So they've moved far beyond John Hunter's diffidence about performing unnecessary surgery. So confident are they in their skills as anatomists, they're willing to chop off every limb they can. So in conclusion, I think what I've tried to show here is the way in which anatomists worked with existing models of polite behaviour, manners, moral philosophy, to present their work in a way which seemed acceptable to their peers. If there's one message from this story, it's that the right to conduct dissections in this period was not won by force. The heroic anatomist, it seems, is the one who achieves his end by strategy and negotiation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.